Eh bien, mesdames et messieurs, bonjour. Nous allons donc... Euh, il nous manque un intervenant, donc j'espère qu'il va arriver. So, welcome everyone. We'll start now. We're still waiting for a person. We have so much to say anyway, so we'll start now waiting for these guests to arrive. So, for those who were there last year, well, if you remember, we made an observation. It was quite disastrous. We said, oh, for one, I, I told you it was going to come. For one euro paid as a fee, we would have two euros costs. So many have gone bankrupt, and our users said that they would rather run after insurance companies. But the situation has not gotten better in the meantime. So what can we do to kickstart the sector again? So it is highly necessary. We'll see that this is a sector which is becoming essential. So we'll see how we get back to good dynamism. So to do this, we have great guests with us today. They're representing insurance companies and users. So they'll introduce themselves in a second. And for insurance companies, we have a broker, an insurance company with, will, they will have different vision, I guess. Maybe they would do the same profession, but they have a different approach. Otherwise, both would be insurance companies. Then you listen to users. And we have two professionals from the sector here have proposals to uh, reboot uh, the sector. So first I'll go around the table and ask you, great, to introduce yourself. Please introduce your company. Hi, I'm in charge of the cyber insurance uh, market for Hiscox. Hiscox is a specialized insurance company in the tech insurance, private art, and so on, and cyber insurance, of course. Laurent. Hi, everyone. I'm Laurent Girardin, cyber security director of Group April. Group April is a broker. Um, wholesaler, 500 million turnover, 300 people working in 16 countries worldwide. So as last year we had Axel as a user, today we have April as a user. Yeah, with an insurance policy. All right, good. Christoph. I'm Christoph Malek, working for Bini. It's a firm, brokerage firm, in not 500 people in, in charge of key accounts risks and um, especially for cyber uh, entrance in the group and then Fabien is our second uh, guest uh, AC Flash USI seventh group worldwide for PCB that's um, well um, a world company based in China uh, the US seven countries I think Maybe we have um, our insurance company here. Uh, we do circuit boards. All right, so first we'll try to assess the situation of the market. So for those who don't know the background, we'll give you a small reminder. So we are at a key uh, time now in our history and we'll get back to this in a second and we'll see what is their practice? We'll see what are the different avenues they're considering for the future. Then we'll ask ourselves a question. Can we get an insurance policy on all this? So let's start with the assessment of the situation. So Christoph, that's for you. So what is the situation today? Is it still that disastrous? Is it better than last year? So some background, historical background. Well, five years back, maybe the cyber insurance grew fast in France. There was this in Jean with Craig and Not Media, uh, a lot of advertising around that. So the cyber insurance market got structured and most insurance companies focus on that more than 10 actually 
did start proposing insurance policies that would specifically cover or hedge some risks, cyber risks. It was a new risk. It was an IT risk in the past. Now we speak about cyber risks. So these policies developed. Then lockdown, COVID-19, you know that. So the information system opened up a lot of remote work and cyber crime that would get organized. And we saw that for two years, there was this wave of uh, IT attacks. And for the insurance uh, market, it was a complicated time. So our policies were used a lot. They worked well. These were new contracts. Some wondered what would be covered and so on. And if we would keep our promises and we did keep the promise, uh, the insurance companies played the game and uh, nobody expected so many claims, you know. So collectively we learned a lot uh, three years back actually or five years ago when you would meet a director of uh, safety or security they considered that we didn't know a lot about many things and we learned a lot in five years time so we all got the necessary upgrade and uh, today cyber policies uh, require different questions we need to answer questions it is hard to sell uh, harder to sell a policy today than in the past why well we're doing our job uh, interest companies try to assess a risk uh, to put a name on a risk some companies are covered they have more cyber maturity and today some companies are still considering investment large investment large amounts and unfortunately they're facing some denials they don't want to or they cannot get a guarantee because insurance company has set prerequisites for cyber insurances car insurance or whatever you know it was a young market now it's getting organized and there is no correspondence between supply and demand so there are unmet expectations insurance companies are taking their uh, well, they're wiser more cautious some say that they will increase their prices by three or four hundred percent i can't say that but we just would put a price on a price tag on the thing in the past now not anymore when we um, and get the price tag we need to be able to pay for the claim when the claim is is coming in so we need to pay the insured so now the uh, price tag is assessed according to the level of risk when people say look it's expensive would I say that the likelihood for you to have a cyber attack in 10 to 15 years is real if you have fire in your building it's not so likely so the cyber interest is at the same at this level today so it's not surprising so it's an evolving market it's a tough market there were renewal campaigns because you usually re renew the contract on the 1st of january or 1st of july it was hard to renew policies the insured had their fees go up fivefold tenfold depends then after five years, some insurance companies were able to propose limits on the guarantees, let's say on average 25 million euros or plus, but today for ransomware risk, which is a major risk, that's 5 million euros guarantee. So for a large group you know, that wants a cover on a policy for 50 million, which is not that huge, you need to be able to work with tensions with companies and each will have their own questions and so on and so on. All right, thank you for that. So it's, it's the reinsurance issue. Fabian, can you feed us back on this? I'm not going to copy and paste what was just said. It is hard for us to find a reinsurance policy or a broker. So we decided to get support from a broker. Well, in the current situation, we were attacked by ransomware and we got flat for two weeks some sites could actually be rebooted right away but others not but we took a lot of measures later on security measures and supported by the insurance company and it's a great asset today for the companies when it comes to their security when you have an insurance company it's your best ally with your uh, board you know and when it comes to using some tools and they have the uh, uh, 
in-depth conviction that you need to move forward. We, even with the editors, some propose insurance policies which are linked and it's hard to get reinsured. So maybe the editor is a partner of choice to tell your main insurance company that you have an additional policy if you take that software for your protection. Well, that's some avenue that you need to think about. But Christoph has already introduced the theme quite well. So I wanted to uh, bounce back on this and uh, walk an additional step forward. All right. No. It's not always about the cost and the fees. You know, the services proposed are reduced on some policies and some uh, operating costs have been taken care of for the time, the time spent by our employees, our staff, or the time they spend on some tasks, not on their usual tasks. This is taken into account, especially when it comes to taking care of the claims. This is really commonplace. Now you see that your teams are working on the claims, even if it's not just um, their task. You know, people doing uh, uh, IT, they're doing claims. Now, they're not unemployed, they're just doing other things. So this is something that should be reckoned with in new policies. Okay, good. Uh, Greg spoke about the evolution and analysis of the situation. There is a systemic risk. Can you further develop? Yeah, that's one of the reasons why you fees go up and why you have you need insurance in damages. So we insure a lot of homes in France. So we must be aware of the systemic risks like floods in some specific areas. So if such an event occurs in an area, we must make sure that we will not insure too many clients in that area. If it is the case, maybe we can end up being in a situation where we don't have enough money to pay everyone. Now, the problem with that is well, that if you want to sell more policies in an area or different areas, you can have a reinsurance policy. So the reinsurers, they have their own limitations, okay, their own limitations for exposure in each geographic area. So they can also try to sell their uh, um, disaster policies to some investors. So they transfer the systemic risk to other players. Now for the cyber risk, it's more complex. Nobody so far has found a way to have these um, uh, disaster bonds. You don't have different areas. You know, it's just one area that's Windows 10. Everybody's using the same system. And so because of that, all insurance companies and reinsurance companies are reaching their limits of exposure. And it happens much faster for other types of policies. So because of that, we end up in a situation where the premiums are very high. And there's another situation in addition. Insurance companies like Chubb are excluding systemic risks for clients with over 250 million euros turnover. So they want to keep selling their new policies, but they have to use this exclusion. So they cannot do it without this uh, exclusion. And for us at Hitchcock, we don't use such an exclusion, but we don't want clients with over 100 million euros turnover because it's not profitable enough. This segment for us is not uh, good enough if we need to take this systemic risk. We need to get enough premiums or fees to pay for the uncertainty because we know the severeness of systemic incidents like uh, breaches in Windows 10, but we don't know how often they take place. So sharing the risk is not enough to make it profitable, right? Okay. So now Christoph, have a, a stupid question for you. But what should we save these offers? Well, we need them. There's a digital risk. It's been there for a long time. So we do risk management and we need to transfer 
part of the risk when it's not bearable or it's too heavy for us because we cannot keep investing forever. And this would be too large amounts anyway. So we need to strike the right balance between supply and demand. This is a young market with 250 million euros premiums to cover the cyber risk in France. It's very little compared to the size of the fire policies, car insurance policies, you know. So insurance companies must be there. Risk management must be there. Cyber risks must be understood and insurance companies today are setting their prerequisites, but we do need that. Some companies are really unhappy that they're not finding a policy. They're not happy with the conditions proposed. They don't have, find enough capacity to cover uh, what they do. So they need to transfer the risk. So we have to, to find the right equation. Okay, specifically on this, what Fabian was telling me that if you look at the insurance policies, is it is it worth it getting a reinsurance policy? Yeah, that's a good question. Reinvestment, you need to make the right decisions. Uh, my counterpart in China is asking me if it's really worth it having a, an insurance policy if one year after the claim, they still have not received a down payment. They have made everything that was necessary to get the money. So it takes a lot of time to get their money. For a big company like IC Flash, it's not good to digest, but for a small company, it will take you down. It's too long. So I'll speak for ourselves, of course, but the increase of our level of security re implies investments, and we need to justify this type of investment. So internally, maybe we could say that we will invest into an insurance policy or increase the level of security and no longer have a policy instead of uh, doing this and we just take every care of everything internally. We've not answered this question yet, but the question has been asked several times and it's hard to make a decision. With the CEO or CIO, we, it's hard to tell these people that the interest policy is interesting because down payments have not been made, etc. For the future, we're asking us because the policies are going up, the prices are going up, but is the policy better? Are we better covering the risks? No. So no decision has been made. Okay. Please come back next year to tell us what you decided. Already now somehow. So Laurent, you spoke about April. Cyber insurance is something we speak from an IT viewpoint, but it's not limited to that, is it? Yeah, where we have a, an insurance policy that because we believe in it, it's useful. Now, reacting to what Fabian said before, what we now see is that, well, uh, we work with partners like many other companies and like many others who are being audited. And if not an audit, at least we get a questionnaire especially when you want a new partner with an insurance policy or an insurance company, a new broker. We're uh, there and we need to answer questions about different security plans and so on to show that we're a serious company and we're a trustworthy company. And so recently we've been asked more and more if we have an insurance policy. I think people have some ideas back in their minds. A company like April would say no then it could be interpreted in different ways. Is it because we could not get a policy because our level of security is too low for us to get a policy or for different reasons? So I think that you said it would be po a possibility to make it mandatory, this cyber insurance, but before it becomes mandatory, it should become somehow to show your seriousness to show the clients and partners are adding us that we are serious people. So if we have these clauses in the partnership contracts, that's complicated. So, 
any insurance companies that still propose cybersecurity? Some had just lost money on that, some have given up on cybersecurity. As a broker, you know insurance companies. When you are a broker, do you still know that there are still companies proposing cybersecurity services? Yeah, we still say that. Some of them are in the room actually. 5 million euro guarantees for an insurance company. It's not enough. When you need, you know, uh, 10 to 20, 25 million euros coverage. So some insurance companies have set, stepped back. Others will study your case, but there should be like a threshold of 30 million, 50 million. Come on. At such a starting point, well, many of our clients will not buy these policies. So we need other players, will be first line players, front row players. So there are still some, are really fewer than in the past for the first millions, but they still do exist. All right, thank you for that. Now, if the market's changing, everybody's level of competence or skills is also changing. So I'll give the floor to Greg. Look, today or yesterday, last year we said that we still had a lot of detailed questions. So evaluation has evolved a lot in a year. Can you confirm? Well, yes, I do confirm. There was not enough competence in the past. Uh, insurance companies didn't have the skilled people in the past to do this type of risk analysis. So we said, do you have some backup? Uh, yeah, but is it secured or what type of backup and so on and so on. Now we do. And generally speaking, we see that insurance companies like us, it's okay, you have Veeam. Well, the immutable backups, do you have that kind of stuff? So we're now more specific with our questions, you know? Now it's just because that we need to do better than in the past. Since 2018, we've had an increase of by 300% uh, when it comes to the claims and 400% into severeness. And it's true, we need to do something so premium increase is one thing, and then we need to work on that. Now we have an insurance company and a broker here. So why do you work with a broker and not directly with an insurance company? Well, uh, we are brokers, so I don't understand why we should not work with a broker. Otherwise, we'd be questioning the true professional brokerage so why such a question working with a broker so we have a, a lot of expertise there but we don't have expertise expertise in cyber insurance contracts so we need to understand you know the pros and the cons to actually well move on with the contract. So we thought it was quite relevant to work with a broker, that's BC here. I think there are two advantages to that. First, I said, well, at the beginning, we're not specializing in cyber insurance and BC specializes in that. They're very good advisors. They're explaining to us what it means. You know, all the paperwork that we'll have to fill in to show that we do what's necessary when it comes to cyber secret. So we get their support to understand all these questions. You need to get to, you know, find the right answers to the, the questions asked to us. So it's great. It's a great set that's helping us. And at a later stage, when we have a claim in cyber security, if there's a security incident, well, there was one that ended up well eventually, but it was November last year, but BC was there and played a key role to advise us, you know? 
when the incident took place, we're panicking, Everybody, everybody's running in all directions, and one of the first things you need to do, and that's me saying that, you need to call an external company to support you, uh, to provide an answer to this incident. When you're a small company, well, a medium-sized company, it's complex, you don't know who you need to call. And it's not when you get the problem that you need to look for somebody to call. So we turn to the broker, with whom we have a true partnership-based relationship, and they say, okay, look, they know. They said to us that they knew this and that company, they would give us specific details of contact persons and would make it a lot easier for us. Okay, so now it's about recommendations and experience. With uh, this specific point, you said that you'd like to get more focus on uh, support that comes after the claim, right? Now, generally speaking, things usually go well. Uh, recently, we spoke about this with our friends from BC, and uh, there's something that struck us in the reply to an incident. So, of course, we tried to replay the whole situation to know who did what, but we didn't expect to see the level of, the, of, of who did what and so much time on what, etc. So, we're surprised by the time spent on this. Apparently, there are tools to do these things and we'll get the necessary equipment, but we were surprised, we are not used to, to that and we discovered things. So these are things we can do to, to do before an event occurs and the broker can help you with the way you need to prepare, uh, especially for the after crisis situation. Yeah, lastly, the broker can also propose help with the insurance company of course. Oh, you understand that it's good. Uh, I believe it's good to have an insurance policy, but in the summary of this conference, we spoke about litigation. In the previous life, I worked for ANSI, and one of our observations at ANSI is that the ESNs were factors of attack against companies, and as a broker and as a company, we can help you with that, or they can help us with that, rather. Yeah, it's about the supply chain. Now, Fabian, there, there were many interesting things that we heard, like uh, to speak about the description of a claim. It's a bit like a car entrance, right? There is a discrepancy between a static vision, a snapshot you take of a sh the shape of a car, and the risks which are dynamic that's on the road. So we claim that the car could have issues and failures when you start driving and the risks will not change. So we check this with a questionnaire, but there are risks, especially in the cyber sector. Now, if you have a technical check, which is dynamic, if you get the necessary software to see where you could have a greater risk or face a greater risk and maybe you could do something, okay, then it's identified, it's documented and so on, right? No, it's not a solution to everything. You cannot change a contract or a policy every time there's a new risk on the market, so you need to set a framework or a baseline. So the question is, which should be your baseline, the one that's closest to the risk to provide the best insurance policy? And then you have the bad pupils, you know, good driver, bad driver, so a company that's taking the necessary measures beforehand, they might be penalized because uh, they were cheating on the costs, etc., or because of the behavior of the driver. That's the company that knows the risk and they still decide to drive with all their problems on board, you know. I, we have a different a uh, car driving license in Belgium, but you could lose points uh, if you were French. So we will be more careful when you need to drive. So have you seen an evolution on the skills? Yes, very clearly. I was an inspector for the Federal Agency on Nuclear Safety. 
and we I saw really the skills on the insurer side I, I saw the skills uh, evolve with those uh, uh, forms that we had to um, fill in and today we are really going into the details we are asking questions is the backup is it being uh, uh, increased tenfold what is being taken into account in case of an attack and it's much more uh, granular and also the skills of the insurers of the experts you are talking to uh, those uh, skills have evolved for the past six years Christophe, you say that the obligations should uh, be uh, customized for uh, the customers. So I don't know what it would look like, perhaps a dynamic contract. Could that be an option? What, what, what would these evolving adapt, uh, obligations uh, mean, uh, in your opinion? Yes, we are asking a lot uh, nowadays. There are some key words, uh, buzzwords such as uh, patch management, MFA, uh, EDR, etc., etc., with uh, many, many details. It's true that it's a, uh, it, it's a prerequisite in terms of risk management, but for smaller companies such as SMEs, it's uh, very hard to roll out and it's not very much very adapted. So we need to have a nuanced approach and uh, uh, surveys are great. Uh, they, they can have uh, some benefits, but they also have their own limits because um, uh, yeah, there, there is a gray area between yes and no. Uh, in a yes and no answer and all companies don't have the same um, level of exposure the risks are not the same and uh, the market is increasingly complex today and some um, maybe if 2022 is a more indulgent year it we need some some type of flexibility uh, the market needs to uh, develop more the more we will mutualize the more it will benefit an entire ecosystem Greg you started talking about that earlier about the skills we've seen um, insurances buying companies we've seen partnerships you are now training people, but what does it mean exactly? Is it just a veneer or does it go beyond that? Well, it depends on the level of subscription. We have junior subscriptors and I've created a, a cyber university that touch upon subjects such as MFA, etc. But we also have a training program for senior subscriptors. Sub and with that, we can have conversations, relevant conversations, and ask the right questions, additional questions. So I think that that should be enough for the uh, subscriptors. Okay, that's great. So we can also then talk to experts. Great, I can see an evolution here. So about um, this evolution of skills, what have you seen? Yes, the skills we can see both in the broker side as well as in the insurer side are very much there. I did not, uh, I wasn't, I didn't contribute to the first uh, insurance contract that was established and we've uh, really observed a very high level of analysis and expertise. And as an RSSI, I've really uh, observed uh, many tools now that exist and that make it possible to assess the maturity of a company. And even insurers can use that to uh, test their vendors and c cyber rating is um, becoming more and more popular. Of course, there are limits to this approach because cyber rating, if you know the topic, 
is very much about the visible part of the iceberg of, of your company, everything that's uh, online, on the internet. It's a very good analysis. However, it only um, focuses on the online exposure. If inside, internally, it's a disaster if your CEO uh, really doesn't care about um, security, the cyber rating won't tell you, tell you that. But it still an, uh, makes possible to have a first um, level of uh, assessment of, uh, of a company. So if I see that you are using NetBIOS, RDP, etc., well, so we see uh, those solutions. For example, uh, last year, when we had an incident on Microsoft Exchange, we used the insight uh, to identify all our uh, clients that are vulnerable to this uh, um, attack. And we uh, contacted everyone and we helped 200 companies So in uh, Germany, many uh, use the Microsoft Exchange, but in France, there are very few of them. It's only the Germans who don't like the cloud. So Fabian, we were talking about two things, accompaniment and follow-up. The two are linked. So what do you... Um, suggest not for yourself but for the insurers so accompaniment clearly having uh, for those who submitted the claim we know that we need to find uh, a vendor among uh, many a supplier and this moment is very crucial when we submit the claim there is a lever effect on that period if it's a very short one then the subsequent stages will um, will uh, will go well. So why not nego negotiating already, having a project, a master project of the few stages of intervention with a leader that will uh, accompany us and whom we would have already met. It's like a fire plan. We have the map already. We know the exits and we know whom uh, to contact uh, in the very first few hours. We have a red line currently and uh, um, this accompaniment period requires to have um, um, an ongoing relationship with the vendor. And we've seen some uh, partners giving us offers just within hours. So this is a very critical point for us and we really need to optimize the time right when the claim is submitted at the beginning of the crisis. There could be a project manager whom would, ha who would, have, uh, would have been met uh, earlier. Laurent, what do you think about this assessment? Uh, what, what needs to be improved in your opinion? So cyber rating is uh, an obvious uh, first uh, step, area of improvement. And what I've observed, even though it's uh, improving, having lengthy surveys that uh, use very classic standards such as ISO, this is quite frustrating because sometimes it's not adapted, adapted to the size of the company and many parameters are not taken into account for me. One obvious parameter is the appetite of the company's management to take on seriously cybersecurity um, issues. And so one of the questions is like, do we share, for example, security dashboards with the uh, board of the company? But I, I may sound uh, harsh, but I really think that it could be, it can be very, very hard to um, find a, a company that takes uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, seriously 
And then sometimes we do have a company that uh, uh, answers the questions properly, but, but doesn't take cybersecurity seriously. So I don't think there is a perfect solution that will, um, that will yield a, a correct uh, cyber security rating. Christophe, you said that one of the main key to unlock all of that could be the way we value all of these. Yes, just to, to go back to what was said, the challenge that the insurer is facing, they have a questionnaire and uh, a survey, and they have two years to assess a risk. So just uh, put yourself in, in, in their shoes. In, uh, in half a day, they need to assess a risk and they need to, to uh, decide whether they will be delivering X million uh, guarantee. And this is a, a huge challenge. So this um, approach, as, as it's, it's quite limited, but the, the questions are, are, are relevant nonetheless. And the topic on which we're all working and we're talking about cyber risks, but if I ask you, if you were to have uh, um, damage uh, tomorrow, what would be the reasonable amount you would expect for the loss? And you will see that when we ask these uh, questions, we don't really have an answer because it's a very simple question, but uh, the, the response, the answer is, is complex because SSC tells us um, we will need uh, 15 days to restart uh, and we can see that uh, this uh, approach has its uh, own limits. However, it is fundamental for a um, simple reason. We need the transparency of information in order to make the work of the insurer easier. If we submit uh, a claim and we can reasonably think that a cyber attack will generate a few hundred millions in loss, then we know that a five million euro guarantee uh, won't do the job. So all cyber uh, damages are not catastrophic and we need to, to continue doing this assessment work, which has two benefits. On the one hand, it makes it, um, insurers can then monitor their exposure to risk because so far the premium is linked to the guarantee and on the other end uh, this will also support your in, uh, request for investment if you assess seriously your exposure and you say tomorrow we will have a ransomware uh, damage um, from a ransomware and it will cost uh, 5 million euros and that and if you back up this um, and you back this up then you will be heard by the uh, management but you need to present facts in order uh, to be heard and on with we are really uh, beating around the bush with regard to cyber security. And uh, when, if we take the example of uh, fires, we put a sprinkler, a sprinkler and we just assume that not everything will burn on cyber. I think we have a collective challenge, both uh, brokers, insurers and company to find a methodology that uh, creates uh, the right visibility. We know companies try to make sure that they are sufficiently insured and not, um, and so the, how we value the, the risk is very important for us. So many thanks. We will uh, close the discussion before mo moving to the Q&A session, I will ask every one of you around the table to ask us, at the end of the day, isn't the cyber risk not uh, insurable? 
Well, I think we can ensure it, but uh, the topic of systemic risk is a complicated one, and most probably we need uh, to uh, use exclusions for that type of risk in the future so that uh, the client can choose whether or not they want guarantee f against uh, systemic risks. I also think that we can ensure it, and I agree with what Christophe said. We, it's very much a, t a tool that can, um, through which companies can mainstream uh, security. I, d I, I, so I don't really think that if the, the money that's not invested in cybersecurity can, can go elsewhere. I think that it's a very, very good tool in, in the company and it's very helpful when, uh, when there is an attack. So this cyber risk, can it be insured? Yes, indeed. As any risk to be uh, insured, uh, it needs to be random. So we need first of all to manage the risk. So, we see it less today that uh, some companies at, may have uh, considered uh, insurance as a solution to their cybersecurity, thinking that whatever happens, it doesn't matter, we're insured. This no longer works because the uh, cyber threat, once uh, uh, it, it really uh, focuses on the, on the most vulnerable companies. And for all those that have uh, bad intentions, it's a, it's a really a win. And Fabian, what about you? I will go back to a topic on which Laurent may not agree. So I will take the example of the German, uh, of the Belgium uh, army, who doesn't really uh, insure its uh, assets. Here we have a random risk, of course, but it's uh, so big that it's uh, hard to find an insurance. So in a world with limited resources, we, may, we need to shift the time necessary to assess the risk and, we, and it requires resources. Today in companies, first of all, uh, very few people have the expertise to do so. On the IT side, to appreciate uh, cyber risk, is, those skills are rare, and we need to find other methodologies. And that we, we can transfer some of that assessment to editors, to the editors. Not all editors have uh, some editors are now um, exploring this market, and it could be an interesting partnership. Are there any questions in the room? And please uh, tell us your name, uh, last name, first name, and where you're from. Ghislaine Lebrun. Uh, Regional Administration of Brittany, I have a question. I worked a lot last week on cyber risk. And my question is about the payment or not of the ransoms. You know that it's, uh, it's a very controversial. There are very different opinions on that. I can say For us, it's, we can always ensure that for our insurance. I know that others have a different opinion. But for us, if we ask uh, a high level enough uh, level of security before s the subscription, then I think it's, it's important that we give this guarantee because in some situations there is no other option than paying the ransom. We cannot have uh, a client that uh, use payment as a, as a 
default option. We have a, a IT service provider who deals with the incident, and if it's in their opinion that there is no other option than to pay the ransom, then we would do so, but it's not an automatic uh, response. Only for 10% of the incidents we do pay, but so it's, it's quite low. So most of the French insurance do not pay, right? Yes, Generali and AXA really uh, uh, do not want to pay. Officially, yes, the moderator uh, makes it clear that it's officially. Personally, I think that everything, uh, it's, it's a very bad idea to pay the ransoms for two reasons. First, there is absolutely no guarantee. There is no guarantee that that we will uh, you will retru retrieve your data. But what's worst even is that by paying the ransoms, you really maintain the system. The companies uh, who are paying the ransoms, it gives an added motivation to the attackers to continue their business because they know that the com companies will pay. So now we are very much talking about the dynamic between the, so, so if you have any questions, please, if you can be focused on offer and, and, and demand. Um, Because there are many, many questions on, on ransoms, but if we can just focus on the, on the topic. Good afternoon, Arthur Chen, Orange Cyber Defense. I have a question about the risk assessment itself. And we talked about uh, the customer surveys that try to assess the level of security of a customer, but we haven't talked much and perhaps and it's really a specificity of the cyber risk that's generated by uh, human beings, which is not the case for uh, fires, right? And so we don't know what their motivations are. And this study of the threat of how it exists in, in nature beyond a single customer, does, does, is this taken into account in the risk assessment? So the cyber threat is, first of all, it's uh, external. It can also be internal. For uh, your information, we had uh, 5,000 notification to the CNIL, which is the French um, regulator of uh, cybersecurity, and many of them were uh, internal ones. And so I was quite surprised because there are 900 companies that had to uh, uh, report um, uh, data leak because of their own employees. So we are now uh, focusing on the uh, principal risk, on the main risk, and uh, the, what uh, scares most people is the ransomware. ransomware uh, but what really costs the most is when the IT system is, uh, is frozen. Conti was dismantled in, in December, but uh, the, the main uh, threat is, is external. Good afternoon, Geoffroy Preti, Beret Point. To go back on the topic of editors, which I find uh, central when we talk about vulnerabilities and risks, are there any good practices we need to um, set up for uh, editors or the managers for insurance coverage and do insurers recommend to integrate in contracts and clauses on the editors uh, insurances and uh, info managers I will answer part of the question I will leave let my colleagues uh, respond so very simply, we can ask, we can request a pass. I don't see myself at April um, 
sign up a new a contract with a new partner without discussing this. So this gives a really good idea of the level of security in the company, what it has set up, MFA, EDR. And I think this is an important element to answer your question. So for the software editors, for their insurance, it's uh, difficult to answer because the professional uh, clauses in France do no longer uh, cover cyber. And on the cyber contract, there are no longer guarantees for the uh, professional damage. So the services that we give are do not cover these uh, harms. So there is a gap in the guarantees. And I don't know if insurance is a solution for that. I can say that for the cloud, for example, we say that the uh, main cloud providers, um, they have more money to spend for the security. But aside from that, we don't have uh, an opinion on what software or what, um, which service providers are better than others. Yes, that's why Fabian was saying that perhaps in the areas of improvement, we need stronger l connections uh, between the insurances and the editors. I, my question was about what's the percentage of companies that have uh, cyber uh, insurance today. In our report, in France, I think the number is 67% for, for France. 67% of companies have an insurance against cyber attacks. So, in to so that's the totality. In the US, it's the same uh, figure, 65%. But I think it's because there are many large clients that no longer have insurance. From what we see, there are figures. Um, there are, diff there are various f figures, right? We've seen a 8% uh, number, and uh, all we know, the only uh, guarantee we know is like most uh, l large companies are insured. Uh, so the penetration rate of uh, cyber insurance is very, very low on uh, SMEs and, and uh, smaller companies, but we have very, we don't have really reliable data to give you a precise answer. But I know that for this analysis, uh, most of the clients to whom we've uh, asked this question are the uh, big accounts. Do we have another question? We have two minutes. Hello, Adrian Capa, Sense Expertise. Uh, in comparison to the other risks, we see we we made an analogy earlier with the sprinklers, but the sprinklers are, are checked every single year uh, according to a certain standard. Would it be useful to think about uh, compliance visits on? all the sites in order to have uh, a common understanding of, of the risks. Yes, that would be useful, but I know that in France uh, there is a new standard similar to the, to the UK where we have cyber essentials, but the ongoing question is uh, does this cover everything or not? And if we have the tool, does it cover also the tool? So does it include the entire network or on, only a part of the network or only a subsidiary? For me, the, the questions I ask 
I need to have the legal cer certainty that if this is not um, set up, then I will not pay the claim. But, but thank you so much. I think we can give a big applause to the panel speakers. Thank you.